morning to everyone. It's good to be in worship with you. It's good to have everybody in Facebook land live streaming with us as well. Uh, if anyone is in the parking lot listening to 95.5, uh, it's good to have you as well. Consider yourself in with us. I know there's some people that had dropped notes to me that they were going to be out today, uh, and we missed them. Uh, very soon, we are going to be calling the church back into the house of worship and encouraging people uh, to do, if possibly they can, anything they can to get back into the habit of coming into God's house and worship. But until then, we are pleased to have people on live streaming and pleased that the body of Christ is represented by you people here as well. Uh, the only significant uh, announcement that I know about is, of course, we are uh, taking up the state missions offering for Dixie Jackson, and there's information in the bulletin about that, the information up on the screen, there's, there's a, bull, a little uh, bulletin on the wall there, so we know you know all about that, and... Uh, Let's get started today with some worship as we say, Lord, we lift your name on high. We love to sing your praises. Would you stand with me, please? Lord, I lift your name on high. Lord, I love to sing your praises. Glad you're in my life. I'm so glad you came to save us. You came from heaven to earth to show the way from the earth to the cross. My debt to pay from the cross to the grave, from the grave to the sky. Lord, I lift you. represented here in this church and God we as believers and representatives of our uh, area and our little uh, town here in our little county just praise you we we can do nothing more valuable today than simply to give you honor and glory and praise you are the almighty Lord, we know that there's many folks that need uh, extra prayer during this pandemic and during the different things that are going on. We especially think of Jessica Allen and Jordan James and, and even Wade Puckett's special on my mind today. Lord, I pray for those that are uh, still in disaster relief in Louisiana and, and probably the months that they still have of work there. And we pray the same, Lord, 
uh, for people in Florida and Alabama as we pray that relief will come to them and will be encouraging to them in this devastating time of disasters. For the wildfires, Lord, in, on the West Coast, will we pray for those people. Protect them if it be your good and kind will, Lord, we, we pray. Lord, we pray for the families of Todd Robertson, family of Billy Walker, family of Chris Wells, Walls, excuse me. We ask that you would encourage those people and lift up their countenance at this time. We will trust in you, Lord, as we look to the hereafter. This is our prayer today. In Jesus Christ's name, I pray. Amen. Well, if you're able, uh, continue to stand, and uh, we'll sing several songs about the hereafter. When the trumpet of the Lord shall sound and time shall be no more, when the morning will be eternal, bright and fair, when the saved of earth shall gather over on the other shore, and the roll is called up yonder, I'll be there.
maybe that song is... <laughs> Be seated, please. How we love that message. How we love those songs. They're near and dear to, to many of our hearts who grew up on gospel music. Um, today's message is hope in the hereafter. And, and, uh, but before I get into that, I wanted to tell you just a little bit about uh, my week. As most of you probably knew, I spent uh, last week in um, Lake Charles, Louisiana, and uh, was with disaster relief and very pleased that I could be there. Uh, but uh, that's quite a ways down there, and uh, I knew that I had to be back in time uh, for between between last week's service and I had to be back for today's service. I, did, I didn't want to leave you off. And uh, so uh, I had to find somebody else that would kind of go with my uh, 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 dates and on my calendar. And, and uh, so I found one young man in Manila, a man named Randy Flanagan. I don't know if that rings a bell to anybody. He's a... He's a uh, retired nurse and we went down there. there's about seven of us on our team and uh if we'll click click angel uh let's see what's our first thing i the first thing we rolled up on uh on the highways we began seeing those big uh, signs that were ripped to pieces and let's go to the next one and uh then we were seeing other devastation. Of course, the, the main devastation that you can imagine from hurricanes are the trees and the roofs. This is roof damage that we saw a whole lot of. Um, the crews that came in the first two weeks spent a lot of their time simply putting um, tarps on uh, roofs. And then uh, as we travel down a little bit further, of course, this is a building. I think it's a little hard to see from the distance that I took this picture, but some large, large buildings, people spending hundreds of thousands of dollars on, on their property. Uh, this is what we spent. Uh, we were on what we call a chainsaw. Crew. And, uh, uh, so all of our guys were in their 60s or above that was on my crew. <laughs> But they were hosses. They did as, at least as much work as I did, I could say. They, they put me to shame a couple of times. I, I tell you, the first day on Monday, I started in it. About 10.30, I looked on my phone. It said 98 degrees, and the humidity wasn't even registering. <laughs> and I, I mean, it was three hours into that work, and y'all, I was ready to go home. I had never felt so bad so quickly on any of this DR disaster relief work. And, and, uh, and just as I was kind of feeling bad and thinking I was wimpy, one of the other men just fell back. <clears throat> and and he, had, uh, he did not have a, a heat stroke. He had heat exhaustion, but he was not able to do a whole lot more that week. And it was just too much. There were over... I would say in our crew, uh, in our, our tent, there was about 210 people working on, uh, with chainsaws in groups of, uh, we were probably the smallest of seven. There's usually nine to 15 people on a crew. And uh, they were working all over this town, town about the same size as, as uh, uh, Jonesboro, uh, 70 to 80,000 and people. And uh, I tell you, you know, it's funny when you see those homes uh, hit like that and, you know, you'll, you'll see the poor and then you'll see the wealthy and you'll see the corporations and they're all bad, you know. <laughs> the storm does not delineate. Um, one thing I did learn, though, every, we started counting all the metal roofs. And uh, the only metal roof, I think we, we, we only counted about 20 or 30 in the areas that we went, but there was only one of them that had uh, uh, damage. And it makes me wish I had a metal roof. <laughs> I think if I lived down there, that would be my investment, would be in, in a good seamless metal roof. Let's, let's continue. Uh, oh, I... 
I'm sorry, is it possible to go back one? I forgot to say one thing about this. If you'll notice on these trees that Justin's showing right now that, that you know, they don't break off where you think they're going to. They break off at about 10 feet. And the problem with that is how dangerous that thing is, you know, to get out of there. Uh, all, all of the stuff that we were cutting as chainsaw crews, we were having to deal with the prospect of things falling on us that had broken up high above our, thank you. Let's go on. Now this was a home, uh, it was a nice, well-built home. You can, I hope you can see from where you're at, it was a brick home. This home, I would guess, wasn't more than 20, 30 years old, you know? And uh, if you looked closer, you would even see that in two different places, there's nice looking uh, zero turn mowers with their front wheels sticking out. Uh, and it fell completely down. Now, just like you've probably experienced when you've seen tornado damage, if we were to look over here about 150, 200 yards to another neighbor, he had a, a, a barn that looked like he put it together with spit and, and it survived and you just don't know how when a, a brick home would just literally fall off itself. There's a lot of pier and beam homes down in the, the older uh, area of town and uh, they are not tied down at all and we would often see houses that were shifted off their foundation and rendered worthless uh, uh, or that they were going to have to have more work than of course we could uh, do for them let's continue root balls were a big concern for our group uh, if you can imagine, there was a seven-year-old and a nine-year-old playing in that yard when we came up. And generally, uh, when the tree's attached, there's not a problem. But what happens with a lot of these companies that come out, they'll say, well, we'll cut down your tree. They'll charge them $1,000 to cut that tree down. And they'll cut the tree and they'll leave the root ball setting up like this. And about more than half the time that we cut a tree off a root ball like that, it falls down and so it's a very dangerous thing to leave out and so we always we have a we have a machine and we always push the root ball back over just to make sure that it's safe let's continue there's some more damage that we had already cut cut a tree and we're hauling out uh, the reason that those are in such big pieces is that we had a a man there with a, a nice Kubota skid steer, uh, and he was able to, you know, grab, you know, a two or three thousand pound piece of uh, timber and in one stroke and run it back out to the street. And boy, that saved us so much work, which means we were able to do probably three to four times as much work as we could have just by hand. A tree that's probably 30 something inches uh, top to bottom. I don't know if you can see the bottom of it, but I, when you would drain, when you would cut these trees, they would start to drain. And uh, there were several gallons of water that came out of this tree. It's kind of an oddity. Uh, I don't know. I don't see that, and I've never seen that when I've cut trees around here. But down there, we, we had that experience all the time. And they weren't empty in the middle, like they were holding this vast array of water. There's the skid steer working uh, uh, in a neighborhood that they had planted some pines, and, and uh, y'all can just imagine the mess that pines make anyway, and uh, the limbs came down. Um, I. I used what's called a pole saw, uh, you know, because of my shoulder surgery, I'm, I'm still kind of afraid to spend a long time on a big chainsaw anymore. And I thought I had graduated out of that to let younger people do that. But, but anyway, the pole saw is a little less dangerous for me to use, you know, and it's, it's not as big a saw, but it works kind of out here. And the nice thing I loved about that pole saw is that, that you know, I was able to reach up to things that weren't already attached, and I didn't have to stand under them to cut them. You know, and I, 
I, and so I did the majority of that tree there. Go ahead, clearing that out. These are some of the guys that were on my team. Um, the fellow on your left is uh, Brother Tommy Jacobs, and he's the pastor at the Baptist Church in Wiener. And he's normally my straw boss, that we call them blue hats. And then the, the white-haired fellow next to him, uh, Gene, uh, until recently was the administrator at Central, the big church in Jonesboro. Let's go on, Angela. Excuse me. <laughs> Justin. <laughs> Story here, uh, if you'll see on, uh, I believe your right is the yellow shirts, the people from Disaster Relief. We were, we were called to a job that there's two trees. But if you'll notice on the left, there's a, another tree service. Do you see those people? Well, these guys... Um, there were about 15 uh, of them. I believe there was a lady involved. They were all Hispanic except for one guy, really nice people. They were from Atlanta, Georgia, and they were on contract for Entergy. So they were just sitting there in the parking lot in their big bucket trucks waiting for Entergy to tell them where to go next. And they were, you know, they didn't enjoy sitting, uh, wasting their time. And so I if you can see the guy in kind of an orangey, ye uh, yellowy kind of, sh uh, no, it's more green, I think, isn't it? Uh, shirt that's kind of in the middle of the picture. As, as we were cutting, um, he would sneak around and would kind of watch us, you know? And uh, he couldn't have been more than 20 years old. And, and he would kind of look to us and say, you know, and look around. <laughs> he was being so coy, it was hilarious. So finally, I went over there to talk to him. Of course, he spoke only Spanish, and, and uh, I, I probably made a fool of myself. But we did communicate. And uh, come to find out, he, was try he wanted to tell them how to cut this tree down. Uh, and it, it was on top of that barn at one point. And uh, he wanted to give them instructions. And so at some point, his boss came up, and nice fella, and... and uh, Finally, he, the young man said, uh, you know, this second tree that I think you can see in the picture, I, I could help you with that. <laughs> and I said, well, you just go for it, man. And pretty soon he had about, I think there were seven of them. He and some of his friends come out there, and they were racing to try to see if he could get that tree cleaned up before we got ours cleaned up. And, uh, the, of course, you can imagine he did. <laughs> <laughs> and did a great job, and he was just doing that because he was bored and wanted to help. Well, there was one fellow that was from far east Tennessee, and he was uh, part of that crew, and I didn't get the story of how he, he hooked up with those guys, but um, as I was trying to share the gospel with him, I found out that he had accepted Christ at some point in his life. He wasn't li really living for the Lord, and I was just encouraging him as best I could in that venue. And, and so uh, at some point, he asked me um, in our conversation, he said, well, why are you here? Why do you even do this? And I tried to express you know, to him as best I could that, you know, I love these people. I hadn't even seen them before, but just if Christ lo loves them, then I love them. And... Um, at the end of the conversation, though, the, the result of that was he said when he was going to go home, he said, you know, I've got this skill of, of working with timber, and I could use that to serve Jesus. And I said, yes, you perfectly could. And he had a new revelation in his life that maybe the life he was living, of course, at present was not what God wanted from him and our and became very apparent in our conversation, but that he could serve God and kind of come back to God. So that was a neat, neat kind of experience for me. Well, do I have another picture, Justin? I'm not, not sure what's next. I've forgotten. No, no. Let's, uh, let's speak about hope. You know, that, that was the crucial reason why I went down there was to bring hope to those people. And we 
have spoken of hope in so many different areas, haven't we, through the, through, uh, the last five weeks now. Hope to encourage one another, to be the hope for one another last week. Today we're speaking of hope in the hereafter. Hope eternal. When life slips through our fingers and we have to face that inevitable, and we all do, don't we? I mean, we all know. You know, they always say nothing's for certain but death and taxes. Most fear death like it's lurking, trying to catch us. A robber in the darkness that, that it's waiting to pounce on us. You know, I don't know about you, but I can remember as a child that I, that I had this unhealthy fear. I had been around people who had, who had died and, and, and I, I didn't understand it. I was not taught. Uh, the, the love that God has uh, for us that gives us hope in the air after. And, I, and I was, so I was afraid. I thought it had something connected with, with, with uh, scary movies and things like that. I had a, a poor connection with that. Some of us think it's the devil himself waiting just to lure us into his lair. Like that's what death is. That death is pain. Many of us think that, that death is equal to some kind of great loss or that death is a thief that comes to steal life from us or steal our loved ones to take what's what we think is near and dear to our hearts away from us and our very core shudders at the sight of the word death we of this generation i think are the worst of all if you think about it that we are far more separated from death than we imagine ever humankind ever being. Uh, we pay somebody else to do our bidding, to tend our farms, to slaughter our meals, to kill the food that we enjoy. Um, we don't even prepare and bury our own dead like they did in the past. So most don't see kin folks when they pass anymore. You know, and this horrible pandemic has made it ten times worse when people are separated from the ones they love and death in the hospital uh, because they're trying to do this social distancing thing. And, and it is just so tough when people pass in the, and, and you can't have a pastor visit, you can't have your family visit. Most are never given the chance to see death up close. And so when it comes, it bites us. It stings us. It's like a yellow jacket. Have you ever stepped on a yellow jacket? Woo, I had them run up my leg one time. You know, they live in a hole, and, and I must have stepped close, and boy, they started up my leg, and I think I got hit three times before I could breathe the next breath. Oh, it was painful for, for a few minutes. But, but death keep stinging. When we lose a loved one, it stings for days and weeks and our hearts sting for months. But God's word says, and you know it very well, oh death, where is your sting? Because Jesus has taken the stinger out of the death. Like you, I carry the death of my loved ones around sometimes very, very unhealthily like baggage. Do you do that? I, I, I've, I've told you, and I'm not going to go into it because I'll probably start crying, but when I lost my little sister, I never got over that. And I carry it around with me all the time. It's very unhealthy. I, I can't let that go from time to time. I go places, and I think of them, and I see them, and I get all emotional. And I've said to the Lord, God, I'm going to let this go. But the memories, they come up in my throat <laughs> and they, they choke me and they tear me up. My sorrow drowns me. It pulls me under the water. Poor, poor, pitiful me. Now, I'm not saying there's not a place to grieve and to be sorrow and sad, but, but there's times where we can't let that go. And I say it to my loss. 
O grave, where is your victory, says God's word. He has taken the victory away from the grave. Let's read that scripture together. It'll be up on the screen, or if you want to look at it in your Bible, 1 Corinthians 15. We're going to read a, a lengthy portion of this. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 50. Seven verses there. I would encourage you, if you want to know more about the scripture today, to go and read the whole chapter of 1 Corinthians 15. Isn't it funny to think that in 1 Corinthians 13, we were talking about the love chapter? And here we are in 1 Corinthians 15. Listen to God's word as he speaks to us. He speaks into our hearts. Now I, this I say, brethren... That flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does corruption inherit incorruption. Behold, I tell you as a mystery, we shall not all sleep, but we'll be changed in a moment, in a twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. Hallelujah. And the trumpet will sound, da -da -da -da, and the dead will be raised incorruptible, and we will be changed. Folks, that is, that is hope. That is excitement. That, that makes me want to endure what I think would be normally impossible. Let's read on. For that corrupt, corruptible must put on incorruption, and the mortal must put on immortality, so that this corruptible has, been, uh, has put on incorruption, and the mortal has put on immortality. Then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written death is swallowed up in victory death where's your victory where is your sting says the scripture now the sting of death and sin and the power of sin is the law but thanks be to God who gives us the victory through Jesus Christ our Lord let me sum up the whole day right now. Hope in the hereafter comes in one thing, victory. There was a very well-educated man more than a half century ago. He had gone to the perfect school, the perfect seminary, made great grades. He was from a fairly well-to-do family. But this man was given a task <laughs> with preaching a revival in a little rural community church in the deep woods of Mississippi. He'd grown up in that state, and he knew exactly what he was getting ready to see in that poor little church. And he had left behind that big city. He had left for a small time that authoritative position he had now taken in a fairly prestigious seminary to go and speak to these little people in Mississippi. And so as he drove through the countryside in his beautiful polished car, he came up on a small store and he thought he'd stop and quench his thirst with a little sodi pop, as they call it. See, as he walked in, he noticed there was this nice elderly black fella dressed in his everyday field garb, sitting on a bench outside, and he gingerly tipped his hat to the old feller. Then he, as he bought his drink, and he, he stepped back out onto the front porch of the store, and he stopped a moment beside the old man, and he took him a big, long swig of that RC Cola. And the two of them exchanged some niceties, and they visited a while, and... and he was asked, what you doing here? What do you do? And those kind of things. And then the old man looked up at this tall, thin, uh, well-dressed, suited, polished, city-slicking looking fellow. And he asked, what you going to preach on tonight? And the young man said, Revelation. And since he didn't get a rise out of the old man from that, he said, and the theological, eschatological exegesis of end times. That old feller let out a big, woo, man. I hear you, brother. 
the young fellow asked, do you, do you understand the book of Revelation? And which the old man says, oh, sure, it's simple. In the end, we's going to win. We's going to win. There's nothing more to say about our ending or the end times than that fact. We win. We're on the winning side. If we have put our faith and trust in Jesus Christ, my friends, whatever else comes my way, we win. It is victory in the Lord to be had every day of our lives as well. We should live in victory looking forward to that eventual hope, knowing we have victory. But in the end, certain eternal victory it's for certain it's for sure it's a guarantee who those are for those who are in christ jesus as that last scripture said but thanks be to god who gives us the victory through our lord jesus christ well that na that night as the young man laid down all his fancy notes to the side of his theological eschatological exegesis of the end times and he began his sermon with the phrase, My friends, we's going to win. You know, there's a winning and a losing. And God simply asks, Which side are you on? It's not the left or the right. It's not the north or the south. Are you on Christ's side? Or on your on the other side? Because there will be certain Death for both. Oh, death, where is your sting? It's gone. It's been defeated for we who love Christ. It was buried. Never more to raise its ugly head. At the time of Christ, Jesus did away with that sting of death. Death became a transference into the presence of God. Death became a positive, not something to be feared. And I, I know we fear, it's our nature, it's in, ingrained in us physically to fear that. But I think we fear the unknown. I think that we fear the pain that may come. My friends, the inevitable is God has us, nothing more. On this side of glory is pain, we know that. On the other side is no pain, no sorrow, no regret. This side of glory is a time that we can do God's bidding. We can be in ministry. We can serve God. We can encourage one another. Live this life in abundance to our fullest, our best. But it's not a penalty. It's not a payment. It's just a world that's in process. And in God's time, we'll be able to get to the other side, won't we? To glory. To be in his presence. Oh, I want to go there. I know he's got a time for me. I don't want to rush it. But I can look forward to it. In the hope that it's going to be something. It's as though it's a prize. I am so glad that God gives me the time I have. And I hope I have more to do his bidding. But at the end of that, when he is done with me, to be in his presence. Hope. We've talked about hope. Hope in God's comfort. Hope in God's peace. Hope that God has our best interest in mind. Hope knowing that God's will is perfect. We've spoken about that. Last week we talked about uh, we could be hope. We could be Christ to others. We could lead them to that hope that he has for us. And now hope. Because we know who holds our future. It is Jesus Christ. And uh, we know that our, our hope and our, excuse me, our future is victorious. Death does not have to be so fearful. We do not have to fear it. Death can become a beautiful process. Just like life, it, things can get messy at death. We all understand that. But in it, we often find God working in us. That final, perfect, sweet, sweet blessing 
for we and our own loved ones. Don't you want that? Oh, I want my final days to be something else, to be an experience to be remembered and relished for those I leave behind. Don't miss out on your final blessings, my friend. Let's just end with this. Four questions. You ready? This will be our end today. Do you have this hope or not? Number two, are you sharing this hope with others? And number three, are you living a victorious life? And finally, number four, are you ready for the victory of eternal life? As we end today, let's consecrate our lives back to the Lord. How about let's remain seated? Is that okay? Uh, let's just remain seated here for a minute. And I want to sing, Have Thine Own Way. Draw me nearer to the cross where I have dried. I have mine, O oh Lord, I have heard thy voice, and it told thy love to me. But I long to rise in the arms of faith and be closer drawn to thee. Draw me speaking to our hearts. Lord, how you've encouraged me through your word as we've studied looking for hope in these last few weeks. And God, I pray as we leave this place that we would be a vessel to share hope with people around us. That we would encourage it. We would lift their countenance. That they might seek you and find you as their Lord and Savior if they don't know you. Lord, would you go and be with us this week? Strengthen us in our walk with you. Help us to grow just a little closer to you, Lord. We love you. We adore you. We want to be hope to the world. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen, friends. Have a good week. Mm -hmm.